This is a DirectX 12 capture of an Allen Wake 2 frame which measures where GPU performance is being significantly harmed. And I'm going to explain each segment to you so that consumers and developers can be more decisive about the definite blow in modern games. Why you ask? Because if consumers like you don't learn the basics of what's happening on their GPU or console, then they will express valid performance concerns regarding their games but pair them with inaccurate performance theories. Allowing developers who enable poor optimization in their games to use your ignorance on the topic to shut you or anyone else's concerns down with some out of context excuse. I'm also showing developers who are trying to fight poor optimization the areas in this game the struggles in, because if we don't learn the lessons of history, history repeats itself. I'm also going to undo worldwide gaslighting claims praising this game as a 9th gen success for visual quality. I'm just going to jump straight into the analysis and then I'll reveal the settings I use for the capture at the end as I point out and describe the logicless approach of this game's graphics. Now here is an overall view of the entire GPU frame process, and notice these empty slots are specified as resource barriers. I say empty because each one of these spaces don't suggest any major GPU usage that would blow up the timings. I'll put relevant links about resource barriers in the description since it's a lengthy DX12 API topic. Notice that it's documented that these can be expensive. Now there are articles from console focused engineers that have written blogs stating that the performance aspect of this draw is not as black and white, so keep that in mind. The next commonly empty draws are copy buffer regions, and the pipeline usually has a little over 100 of these per frame. Now very few of these display major GPU usage, but the ones that do have a combined cost of 0.5 milliseconds. I've never seen resource copying take more than 0.2% of the frame's budget, but here, we're looking at around 2.5% of the GPU budget. I'm going to change the bar chart visualization so that the empty slots aren't as visible and the performance outliers can stand out a bit more. Now the first chunk is made up of global wind simulation for foliage movement. We're talking around 0.6 milliseconds worth of computation. With optimized foliage, wind movement is usually done in the vertex shader as geometry is shaded and iterates on movement values as frames are generated. Vertex shaders tend to be more expensive than pixel shaders, but what makes them so efficient for foliage movement when using optimized foliage models is that those vertex shaders are only used per vertex, whereas pixel shaders are used per pixel for shading. The pixel shader just interpolates those vertex shader calculated positions. In Allen Wake 2, foliage uses bones for movement, which makes these assets skin objects, which are calculated on the GPU. In fact, the next part of the pipeline is more skinning related computations, and this measures around 1.6 milliseconds. The next part is most likely the pre-pass that renders all the geometry that wasn't called in the last frame, but with the updated camera view and animations. Since disabling the later mesh draws causes black holes in the GPU for resolves. Disabling the early ones allow for different things to be rendered due to culling differences. This pre-pass takes about a full millisecond, and that's a bit much because the character in foliage is costing around 0.8 milliseconds, because it's a lot of context the GPU is working harder to access slash process. So rendering those only in the base pass would prevent that cost, and to prevent single pixel overdraw, the objects rendered in the pre-pass should be shaded last in the base pass. But that's the goal for traditional optimized rendering. A meshlet system is very dependent on full pre-passing for culling, which makes it very anti-performance. This next portion costs around 3 milliseconds and has shaders that specify GPU culling, but this portion also does mesh draws for 5, 512 by 512 shadow maps. Now, I wasn't able to isolate the culling cost for the main view, but I can disable these outlier mesh drawings which take up about 1 millisecond. These are responsible for the leaf detail and shadows, but a really important thing to take notice with is that the terrain meshes aren't excluded from the shadow pass. There are still people trying to say that Days Gone isn't a good example of optimization, yet it's the only game out of these three examples that manages pine tree shadows with specific techniques that run way faster. But they don't have moving leaves in comparison. With those low to maxed out shadows with moving leaves aren't exactly a sight to behold for the cost that they induce, nor are they even accurate to the ray trace reference. The next portion is the biggest performance killer taking a minimum of 1.7 milliseconds to complete and it relates to the base pass rendering of terrain. Terrain meshes are already prone to poor rendering efficiency because the material shaders they use blend and access a lot of textures at once. This is still about three times more expensive than it should be for the quality it produces. It's using software tessellation which is ridiculous because it's too blurry and dark to even justify that detail that could have been produced with smarter shader tricks. A small draw updates its motion vector texture which I confirmed is written independently of the terrain draw before it. The following draws cost around 2 milliseconds. The highlighted bars are responsible for shading the black areas of these base pass geometry buffers. 0.28 milliseconds for a copy buffer region and another 0.4 milliseconds is used for a draw that manages rain effect assets. Next, 0.6 milliseconds is used to calculate an effect name LSAO. Which is a little confusing since it either stands for large scale ambient occlusion based on the technique in Homefront the Revolution or line sweep ambient obscurance mentioned in Remedy's older presentations. You might think the latter is more likely, but watch until the end to understand why it may not be that simple. Tracing a distance field scene, specular textures are generated at the cost of around 3.3 milliseconds. 
The purpose of the next outlier dispatch isn't clear, but it does generate a more traditional normal texture out of the noisier encoded variant at the cost of 0.6 milliseconds. 0.3 milliseconds is used to update liquid fog data. Then, 0.8 milliseconds is used to compute the diffuse and speculative values of the character's flashlight in two different lighting channels. More lighting is added in the smaller draws next to it for a 0.2 millisecond cost. Then all the diffuse lighting information is combined into this texture with exposure compensation. 0.4 milliseconds is used to smooth subsurface scatter skin, and I'll show you a secondary capture that shows smaller changes like this more specifically. 0.6 milliseconds is used to generate information about the volumetric fog, which looks awful in this game. This 1.5 millisecond portion produces a lit scene, shades fog, processes bloom and exposure, and our secondary capture had motion blur enabled at the additional cost of 0.3 milliseconds. 0.08 milliseconds is used for rain screen effects, and four major dispatches begin computing FSR2's native 1080p anti-aliasing, which takes an offensive 2 milliseconds to calculate. Notice how noise is more apparent without FSR2. Consumers need to stop praising these temporal solutions for so-called removing noisy graphic issues, because in reality nothing is being removed. It's just being hidden with blur. Consumers need to criticize the noisy graphics underneath the temporal solutions that were designed to abuse the temporal blur instead. Now people are going to mention the tree and mention how FSR2 is fixing the breakup, but FSR2 is doing this wrong. Anti-aliasing is about per pixel sampling, but this isn't anti-aliasing. This is averaging detail from multiple frames, which means current frame detail gets obliterated, when current frame detail should only be enhanced. FSR2 in motion isn't even the biggest quality issue either. It's not even good at anti-aliasing basic staircasing, which a morphological AA or MLA based TAA can easily solve, and it has too many jitter positions that cause flicker. The image is then color graded in 0.18 milliseconds. Another 0.2 milliseconds is used by 42 smaller draws, which you can judge for yourself in terms of importance. Everything I've shown adds up to a 19 millisecond budget, and that's pretty accurate with the non v sync experience I got from the desktop 3060. I'm about to share some major conclusions some of which directly correct Alex Battaglia's highly incompetent and decontextualized description of this game's graphic approach. Conclusion number one concerns GPU skinning. Take a look at this scene from the remastered Crisis 2. Notice anything inconsistent or eye-catching? Well, if you have noticed it, I'm sure it's because I'm not moving the camera. You see, vertex manipulation shaders are a lot harder on ray tracing. It's either ignored in the ray tracing scene or induces significant costs if evaluated because again, ray tracing is not necessarily expensive, nor does it guarantee realism. The cost of rays becomes more expensive when the information it retrieves becomes more and more complex. Skin meshes are a lot less of a hassle for ray tracing, which could explain the approach for this game. But it's also possible that the meshlet system doesn't support vertex movement. Nanite also has performance issues with vertex shader movement, and with 5.5 supporting skin meshes for Nanite, UE5 games in the future could end up with a lot more GPU computed skinning for foliage. Considering we only have so much computational room on 9th gen to improve visuals, this is a horrible waste of GPU power and millisecond timings. Conclusion 2 regards geometry. Obviously terrain optimization needs to be fixed instead of wasting modern GPU performance. If you analyze my Days Gone analysis, you'll probably notice that Alan Wake 2's geo timing is only 0.2 milliseconds more. So some of you might assume that Alan Wake 2 is on the right path for performance. Well, no. That capture was showing a lot more content and I stated Days Gone's geometry pass was heavily flawed due to full pre-passing. But I hear a lot of people defending Alan Wake 2's approach, and people like Alex from Digital Foundry saying this is just how it is, and blindly crediting what I and many others consider basic visual fidelity such as roundness to a system they assume they understand. Traditional rendering uses quads, which means pixels can vary in cost based on the size of triangles or topology. We didn't get roundness in 8th gen titles because that required little triangles, which leaked precious limited GPU performance. On 9th gen adjacent hardware, the quad leakage of selective roundness is now viable, and its cost can be relieved with max area topology. Systems like Nanite use quadless software rasterization to shade pixels at a cost that's in between the worst and best case quad scenario, which also makes upscaling seem more valuable for an FPS increase. People pretend these systems offer a high but flat cost. That's wrong because the culling logic isn't flat or even efficient, and material shaders sure as heck aren't flat either. A popular question this game prompts is does the reinvention of rendering have any substantial benefits? Anyone who looks at the pipeline and the geometric failures can easily tell the answer is a clear no. The smooth geometry excuse falls apart really easily when you're paying a major cost for 7th gen like Poppin and you still end up with polygonal issues. The solution for our use case scenario, including Alan Wake 2, if any software rasterization is to be used with quad rendered optimized topology is pre-computed visibility, which admittedly could benefit from more modern research but there's still a major problem with hybrid rendering, which leads us into the topic of Conclusion 3 regarding shadows. This game has to rely on small shadow maps to sustain the geometric complexity, 
So all this work gets done for geometry that looks basic to arguably bad and you end up with downgraded visual aspects that were viable in other games on the same hardware. This is one of the things I really hate about Keras' and Epic's documentation regarding Nanite. They say it's small enough for a 16 millisecond budget, but they don't mention the shadow cost. Brian Karras and the engineers who ended up extending his work never solved the common use case, but the people who didn't think about the use case were too blind to notice the red flags in the original presentation. The existing solutions for shadowing these techniques are expensive UEFI VSMs, or very low resolution shadows, in Unreal's case you're losing fast and TAA independent shadow softening for noisy garbage, expensive ray trace shadows plus the denoiser cost, or noisy megalite similar solutions. The only somewhat performance solution for high density meshes are distance field shadows, but only for static objects. For conclusion 4, we need to analyze the real time behavior of this game's graphic pipeline, starting from low settings then gradually converting to the optimized settings we use for our primary capture. On the lowest settings the game looks like garbage, and indoors it's a little bit better. But what's causing this gross blueness? Well a simple way of looking at game materials is knowing the roughness will determine if the specular or diffused evaluation will be more predominantly perceived when the scene is lit. Most objects need a low roughness to appear wet, so the GPU is programmed to access assets in VRAM that provide a specular information. On the lowest settings, the only specular information provided is this global Q map. The lighting shader uses math to check the world normal and depth G-buffer value in conjunction with the camera position values to see what part of the Q map should be perceived on that low roughness pixel. Because it's pretty much only two colors and doesn't contain any local lighting information, normal values facing down sample the dark colors on the Q map, but normal values pointing any other direction samples the bright blue but your brain knows from that perspective the specular light should bounce from this direction sampling the building. The shader only sees this and samples that, unless you turn on screen space reflections, which adds screen space access for the specular evaluations. But this game has terribly noisy screen space reflections that aren't even that good, and that's due to neglect. Modified Frost by SSR has peak quality to performance ratio. In order to enforce subconscious realism, you have to trace against a distance field scene for a 2 millisecond cost for proper specular coherence so that the Q map is occluded. But take a look at the scene with these different configurations. Unless both reflections are enabled in some way, you don't get proper occlusion from that main Q map. The lowest combined cost is 2.4 milliseconds, but it's not even that advanced for occlusion despite Alex Patalia's overhyped description. The system only represents large occluders that could have been billboard reflections nearby, and by analyzing low translucence, we've seen comparable specular occlusion via SDFs shown 13 years ago in U3, meaning those approaches or even slightly extended versions would probably be pretty fast on modern hardware. Knowing these also outlines some potential approaches. Now I'm turning off SSR so you can focus on the interior diffused lighting which is going to better display the lighting behavior than outside environments. But Talia credited demanding performance to the ray trace lighting, when this game mainly uses baked AO, which is why I mentioned large scale ambient occlusion. But the indirect bounce light is a radiance base, which is not next generation by any means. This game's lighting clearly combines baked AO with baked irradiance probes, which even the shaders mention. The only somewhat radiance-alike information this game provides is through the directional appearance of the baked AO and slash indirect shadowing so that you can perceive more realistic lighting. Only one setting here needs to be enabled to match our capture settings. That would be the hack SSAO as Vitaly referred to it despite it being so good it made him think that the indirect lighting systems were using dynamic RTGI. When it comes to the pleasing visual aspects, it's achieved with layers of relatively simple hacks, just approach in overly complicated ways. But the SSAO is different. Now first of all, yes, it does suffer from noise, but the quick solution to that would be adding a cheap temporal component inside the buffer. This SSAO takes into account local lighting directions, further enhancing your subconscious memory regarding radiance-based lighting behavior. Take a look at the scene. This SSAO acts as shadowing and AO, but then you have people who mention how much better the quote, path trace lighting looks in comparison. I have a better solution than both of these. Optimized objects and a regular shadow map. That would cost far less, but no, modern games require path tracing to get shadows casted properly on walls. Once again we encounter butchered rasterized graphics that promote computationally expensive solutions that can only run at decent quality on GPUs that aren't just costly, but also hard to find a proper MSRP on. Nvidia GPUs and game sales from titles like Monster Hunter Wilds are going to thrive because millions of people are still aligned with a set of marketing and honestly, an outdated rotting paradigm. The kind of standard that makes a person ask for vendor accelerated software instead of proper optimization. This 8th month old channel has been demolishing horribly damaging narratives with undeniable proof, data that is exclusively covered on this channel, and we are somewhat reviving gaming standards, but we are also creating new standards. A true paradigm shift that is caused by heavily educated consumers and developers that appreciate real and proper optimization. 
but I need to give a brief warning about trends happening online that I named fake correcting in regards to topics we mentioned. I will mention topic A and provide extensive data on topic A because it's required to understand issue B, which I then extensively explain. People on social media lie. They claim the facts are wrong by giving false explanations about how things actually work. The bigger problem is that these people are distracting you from learning by causing so much confusion and spreading so much ignorance. I'll give you a clue on how to spot fake correcting media. For example, let's say I talk about UE5 is incapable of making realistic apple trees. And you hear someone say an exaggerated misquote of what I actually said, such as, UE5 can absolutely make trees, he is wrong. When you hear a blanket absolute misquote, that is a clue that you've summoned upon a fake corrector. If you feel confused, go back and listen to the original quote from the original source, and you can easily see for yourself who is blowing smoke and mirrors. This is a culture war against complacency, and some areas will require brute force spreading of information we provide. Smash that like button and hit subscribe because the bigger these numbers get, the more pressure we create for the market to change. Before I end this video, remember that the industry got here because people took optimization for granted. But this channel is reversing the cultural damage that's been done to the gaming community. Please do not take this channel or myself for granted. Thank you so much for your support.